All right, so I think I can start. Um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Ophelie. I will present this webinar. The aim is to give you an overview of what's going on in the European broadband landscape for 2024 and onwards. Uh, we'll look at what the current access technology structure is, how faster internet is being brought to European homes, how fast this internet is and uh, by whom it's brought um, to European households and what are the key challenges looking ahead. Um, one topic also that we will cover throughout the, the webinar would be the discussions that actors of the industry should have um, now and for the future. Uh, this is in the context of our upcoming Next Giga Connect conference. Uh, this will be the third edition for Europe and it will happen in a month um, on June 4th in London. So feel free to join us. It will be at the Cavendish Conference Center. Um, so after addressing the Berlin and Prague uh, locations where we had a uh, stronger focus on Central European and German uh, actors, we will now address the specificities of the UK market, but also still bringing together people from the whole region. So it will be really nice for you all to join and have a large panorama of market cases across Europe. Um, I also apologize for my broken voice, um, but I hope you can still hear me well. And without further ado, let's dive into the agenda. So I will review the points that you saw on the programs throughout the presentation, starting with the state of the fiber deployment and multi-gig network availabilities uh, across Europe. So as you can see on the chart, or you can't really see the exact number, but I'm going to point it out to you. In 2024, Europe will pass the 100 million households connected to full fiber broadband plants. Uh, which is a huge milestone, obviously, this is excluding Russia. Um, so this means that fiber will represent more than half of all broadband connections in Europe by 2025. And the access uh, will be reaching the 150 million threshold by 2028. Uh, and this would actually be 2025 if we included Russia. Um, so the volume of the fiber market is huge, but as you can see on the chart, there are still other uh, very important access technologies uh, that are used in Europe. Um, but DSL is losing ground gradually. Uh, ADSL is less and less relevant in a society driven by fast internet usage. As you can see, it's uh, slowly dying off and a lot of copper networks will be decommissioned in the coming years. Um, and cable, meanwhile, in pink on the chart, is retaining an overall stable but still declining market share. Uh, this is mainly due to cable co's uh, retaining a strong presence in key markets like German-speaking countries, the UK and Benelux, uh, where their offer are still very competitive and, uh, and they retain a significant penetration of the broadband market. Um, this also explains partly why some of those countries have been lagging behind a little bit in terms of fiber rollout. But uh, all cable co's have now addressed the fact that they're investing in fiber networks as well. So clearly the future of high-speed broadband in the region will be on optical fiber. And there's only a few selected market cases where initiatives are being launched around DOCSIS 4.0. Uh, but this is not something that will shape the industry in the future. To discuss uh, topics around the deployment of various access networks that are enabling high-speed broadband in European homes, we will have different panels. I just wanted to point out uh, in the next Giga conference, we will have specifically one panel dedicated to the state of the fiber deployment in Europe with people from all across the industry will have the chairman of the FTTH Council who will give a broad overview of the current rollout. We will also have someone from Adamo, a fiber co in Spain, um, which also operates their own fiber services. Uh, Kelag from Austria, which is a utility service provider that operates also telecom services and has a more local perspective on how fiber can be rolled out in, uh, in the market like Austria, which has been also uh, quite slow in terms of fiber because cable was so strong there. And we will have from the equipment side, Technetics, who is supporting fiber networks expansion with various customers across the region. Uh, another key topic that is interesting to point out is the way that alternative um, access technologies are also taking a share of the market by enabling high-speed broadband. 
there's not so much competition as I just mentioned uh, on the fixed segment, on the fixed wireline segment, sorry, um, against optical fiber because DOCSIS is, uh, is slowly being um, phased out of the strategies of uh, cable costs for the future. But on wireless, 5G is creating new opportunities for mobile networks to address the fixed market, especially with high-speed capacity. And to discuss this, we will have someone from Liberty Global, the VP strategy. We will also have the president of the Hellenic uh, Telecommunications and Post Commission, the, the Greek regulator. And we will also have the CTO of a local UK-based ISP, Urban Community Fiber, which is addressing its market with uh, 5G and fixed wireless. Now to dive a little bit more into the fiber rollout challenges, uh, we will have a focus now on the premises past, especially in Western Europe. So in Western Europe alone, more than 117 million unique premises were connected to full fiber by the end of 2023. Um, but fiber networks collectively connected almost 270 million premises at the end of the same period which means that there was an overall 2.3 overbuild ratio across Western Europe, um, which is really high, uh, but it's mostly due to high level of overbuild in specific countries like Spain and Portugal, where building costs are really, really small compared to neighborhood markets. Uh, for example, in Spain, at the end of 2023, the average number of fiber networks connected to one premise was 4.5. Uh, which led to uh, the shaping of a very, very competitive wholesale landscape. As you can see on the chart on the right, actually, Spain has a really baffling number of accumulated premises connected by various networks um, competing against one another. And as you can also see on the same chart, UK and Germany, which are very um, big consumer markets in Western Europe, have a limited number of both uh, fiber premises connected and fiber subscribers. Uh, this is mainly due to their slower rollout for reasons mentioned previously, but it has accelerated significantly since the early 2020s. Now, if we talk about the challenges that fiber calls will specifically need to address in 2024 and beyond, um, the main issue is converting uh, connected premises to paying customers. It's something that investors were counting on. Basically, they were expecting revenues driven by the first customers to um, nourish or yeah, be invested in further fiber expansion. Uh, but that has proven a bit too optimistic for several um, networks and in several market cases as well. We have seen signs that the fiberco gold rush was running out already since 2023 and a bit before that, with, for example, in the UK, several British asnets announcing job cuts and project freezes uh, during the year. And across the region, so including also Western and Central Europe, we've seen uh, asnets pushing their targets back in terms of um, the number of premises they expected to connect or the dates that they expected to connect them uh, before. And that's especially the case for fiber codes that are backed by investment fund or external uh, investors um, overall. They are now trying to meet expectations by acquiring competitors who are now uh, at a lower price tag than a few years back. And uh, they also, or they are actually unable to sustain their own rollout with enough liquidity, so getting acquired. Um, this can be explained by several factors. One would be a joint effect of two major structural trends, the overall context of rising costs of labor and material and the dramatically increased interest rates since 2022. Uh, also in the short term, a more marketing explanation, marketing related explanation with uh, lower take up rates um, because customers don't necessarily see the difference between fiber plans and other access technologies, especially when the advertised speed is similar and the price tag is not much different, um, which meant that it has been difficult for fiber networks to drive new customers on their access techno. Um, and also it means that RPUs are generally not as attractive as investors expected them to be because customers don't necessarily want to pay more for optical fiber just because it's a new techno. 
Um, and uh, another point that we briefly touched upon would be the very strong competition uh, that fiber codes are submitted to in dense areas with um, a fight over premises connected sometimes to two or three or more networks overlapping and thus a potential take up rate that is capped under 50%. Um, and another factor, again, would be that at the point where we're standing now, uh, a lot of new premises that are left to connect are more rural and more and located in more remote areas, uh, which are notoriously more difficult and more expensive to connect. So it's also requiring a lot more investment, which is less attractive in terms of ROI. Uh, the direct consequence of that is that uh, we expect the rollout of fiber to slow down across the region. So between 2022, no, between 2021 and 2022, we counted um, an increase of more than 20% new premises built. Um, then this number was 17% still during 2023. So still a, a significant um, decrease in the growth. Uh, we expect this number to actually decrease further and just be at 12% for year 2024 and 10% for year 2025. So clearly the market is maturing, even though there's still a lot of premises to be connected. Um, we will have a few talks uh, on the future of fiber at the conference. One would be with fiber codes. Um, as I expect, as I mentioned previously, we expect a lot of consolidation on this market, especially with the context of the tension that nets are submitted to on both financial and operational levels, and also because larger actors have started to consolidate smaller networks to meet to meet their own building targets. Um, so this is an underlying trend that we will cover in the discussion here with actors from both the UK and Germany. Uh, namely Netonia, B4, Fibrous, and Northern Fiber Holding. And another discussion that's also going to be quite interesting will be around the rollout of multi-gig connectivity on fiber access network. Uh, we will have the first returns of experience from operators that have started commercializing uh, multi-gig connectivity uh, with sometimes eight or 10 gigabits per second plans to their end customers. And we'll also talk with them about how they plan on rolling out 25, 50, or even 100 gig capacity on their network. Now, if you look at the market on the nectar level, um, there has been a slew of acquisition and consolidations over the last few years that are reshaping the industry. Um, I want to point out the case of Vodafone. Uh, we see on the chart that they're still by far the largest cable co in Europe. Um, they're also the largest telco operator if we come for all uh, revenue generating units, including mobile, as they have a very strong position on this market segment. Uh, but they've been divesting some of their assets in the key markets. Uh, they sold to FastWeb in Italy in March. They sold to Zigona in Spain last October. They are merging with Free in the UK. And before that, they also sold to 4IG in Hungary. Um, so they've been slowly losing ground by divesting and re-optimizing, let's say, the assets that they have across the region, uh, while the other telcos don't necessarily have the same strategies. For example, Orange um, has been consolidating its position in their key markets uh, by acquiring smaller competitors uh, that strengthen their position. For example, the acquisition of Wu in Belgium or the expansion of their assets in Romania by the investment they made in uh, the incumbent. Uh, Dutch Telecom is also still very strong, as you can see on the chart, but their growth is mostly driven now by T-Mobile in the US, and it's the key asset that the group is focused on at the moment. And another actor that's progressing very fast would be Iliad. Uh, they've been active in France and Italy for several years. They're also behind SALT in Switzerland. They're a shareholder of the Irish incumbent AIR. They are also behind PLAY in Poland, and they acquired the, the major cable co locally, UPC Polska, from Liberty Global a few years back. But on top of that, they're also expanding to new territories, um, especially recently. They just invested 6% in Proximus. They acquired LifeCell, a mobile operator, and Volia, a cable co in Ukraine, a few weeks back. And they also became the main shareholder behind Tele2, which is active in Sweden and the Baltics. 
So based on all this, uh, this moves, uh, financial moves, but also operational moves, the evolution that we see uh, in the market is quite significant. It's also driven by how access technologies are progressing uh, with fiber dominating more and more the market and uh, cable calls us who used to be leaders now trying to optimize their current operation um, and also actively uh, incre increasingly investing in infrastructure, uh, fiber network infrastructure. <clears throat> we also see new entrants that are hyper-focused on fiber, for example, DG, uh, Romanian group, um, and 5G, which will take a significant space in the coming years. And we also see multiple new actors arriving on service-driven landscape with infrastructure and services increasingly split between two completely distinct uh, entities which means that very small actors can now offer a telecom service without it necessarily being their core service or <clears throat> without necessarily having much experience or a huge barrier to entry due to the cost of infrastructure maintenance. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm gonna take a bit of water. Oh. As you can also, not see from the chart, but you probably all know that all those main telco groups in Europe are convergent. Uh, they operate diversified services across multiple access network. As you can see in the color, a lot of them have uh, various legacy technologies or new technologies in terms of access in their portfolio, but they also uh, provide a wide variety of services including TV, streaming, but also other types of entertainment like uh, gaming or insurance, banking, etc. And they also operate uh, user bases that have very different preferences, usages and connectivity needs across multiple territories. So all that uh, to say that their strategies are driven by some key topics that um, I want to point out right now as well. Uh, one would be diversification, so how the integration of multiple services adjacent to connectivity is key for telcos to gain or retain their customers, and what are the concrete solutions that they implement to secure their subscriber base in a very dynamic competitive landscape. Uh, here we would have speakers from Connect Fiber, White Fiber, Ogi, and Cine Media. Another key topic of the industry is sustainability. Uh, obviously, it's a huge, uh, huge point for telcos and for significant companies in this space. Um, it comes around improving the energy efficiency of networks, implementing refurbishment strategies for devices, but also reaching the zero carbon footprint targets that they put to themselves or that authorities also uh, push to telco companies. Uh, so we'll have huge um, speakers for that from Vodafone, Virgin Media O2, and TalkTalk. Talk. And we'll also have the general director of the European Telecommunications Network Operators Organization to discuss all this. And finally, a new topic for us to address that, uh, that will make waves in the industry in the year that is um, that is happening now, but also in the coming years, it would be new technologies and AI. So how artificial intelligence is being integrated in telco strategies for the future? How is new techno utilized to improve performance and efficiency? And there we will have speakers from A1, Free, Turknet, and the Wireless Broadband Alliance. Very excited about this panel. Um, and finally, the last topic that I wanted to cover in this uh, presentation is how the broadband equipment is also evolving with the access network, with the, um, the subscriptions um, to match the light speed connectivity that are brought, that is brought by uh, the latest access network. So mostly optical fiber, but also fixed 5G. Operators need to address the whole continuum, um, so from the access network to home connections to gateways, and finally to the Wi-Fi that is delivering connectivity to the end devices of their customers. 
Um, so they need increasingly to provide their subscribers with devices that support the input of multi-gig access networks onto the gateway. Uh, thus, we're talking about integrating 2.5 gigabit LAN ports, even 10 gigabit LAN, port, LAN ports on the modems. We're also talking about integrating the latest standards of Wi-Fi. Uh, virtually all tier one and a lot of tier twos have already launched Wi-Fi 6 gateways. Uh, we're also seeing Wi-Fi 7 arriving on the market and a handful of them have launched uh, Wi-Fi 6E in between. Uh, to meet connectivity needs from their customers. And just to name a few of uh, the most advanced gateways that are now on the market, um, we got the Orange Lightbox 7, uh, Wigs B-Box All Team. We have Virgin Media O2 who launched the Virgin Media Hub 5X, Vodafone who launched the Vodafone Pro 2 Ultra Hub in Swiss, which as you can see on the chart is the most advanced markets when it comes to availability of multi-gig uh, broadband plans. Uh, we have the Salts Fiber Box X6, uh, Swisscom's Internet Box 4, and Sunrise's Connect Box 3. And we also have the latest GPON boxes launched by the Telecom across their group assets. And uh, one that I wanted to point out um, as the last cherry on top, let's say uh, the Freebox Ultra, the ninth version of the, the Freebox, which uh, supports two, four times. 2.5 gigs LAN ports, it's it's hard to say. And it's also the first Wi-Fi 7 uh, gateway to be rolled out commercially in Western Europe. Um, we also know that further launches will arrive on the market. It has been announced by BT already uh, with the EE Smart Hub 4, uh, which will be on Wi-Fi 7, and is in line with their new 1.6 gig broadband plan, which you can see at the far right of this chart um uh, where they need to provide the actual service behind the advertised speed and this is really at the core of tier one operator strategy as you can see a lot of them are already advertising multi-gig uh, broadband plans to their subscribers uh, it's also a key strategy for some tier two or new entrants that want to distinguish themselves from the rest of the market People who are already operating uh, advanced networks, for example, working on XGS uh, networks and who can afford to uh, advertise uh, light speed connectivity to their audiences. So it's clearly something that we'll see uh, popping up more and more across the market. Um, and we will have a panel that will actually be dedicated to the end device connectivity. So making sure that the speed uh, brought to the end devices is actually in line with what the service is capable of. Um, we're talking about Wi-Fi management here, but also making sure that devices uh, in home are appropriate to, to bring that to customers. And we will have the Director of Connectivity Strategy for Liberty Global, the VP Industry Engagement uh, for the wire Wireless Broadband A Alliance, the VP One Insurance Entertainment and In Home Connectivity for Sunrise, the Director of Internet, Voice Mobile, and UC Products at Proximus, and the Managing Director of FiberNest. So, just to uh, take your calendars now and drop the dates, the conference is on June 4th in London at the Cavendish Conference Center. Uh, we'll talk about all the topics I mentioned during the presentation. If you want more detail on the program and on the speakers, you can go on our website. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you'd like to reach out, feel free to join me on LinkedIn or reach out to our team through this email address here. If you want to understand more about what we can provide in terms of market intelligence, or if you want to discuss the data itself, or if you want to I don't know, discuss the trends on the market. Feel free to reach out. It would be really nice to, to have some feedback. Thank you. And I wish you all a good afternoon or a good morning, wherever you're based. Bye.